Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, you're in day three, session three, mapping the pandemic. I'm Byron Moldowski, and I'll be your moderator. And um, uh, with me to start the session are Robert Harris and Cleo marsh -Nikis. And uh, they both work at the New Brunswick Department of Justice and Public Safety. And they're going to share their experience using spatial tools for effective public communication during the pandemic. And now after uh, Robert and Cleo give their presentation, we'll go on to our panel discussion uh, uh, following. So uh, thanks very much, Robert and Cleo. Go ahead and share your screen and I'll, uh, I'll just hang on until that comes up properly. Okay, you should see that now. Looks good. Great. Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, we're excited to be here today. A lot of the work we do um, tends to stay out of sight, so we're looking forward to giving you a bit of a glimpse into our world. My name is Cleo Marshnikius, and I'm a geomatics analyst at NB911. And also presenting with me is Robert Harris, the geomatics manager at NB911. Um, as well as my fellow geomatics analyst Colin Lang was going to be presenting with us today, but was un unable to due to a family emergency. Um, also, we just want to mention that as COVID-19 is an ongoing situation, we have removed sensitive information um, from our presentation and we are doing our best to comment and cover as many elements as we can and feel free to ask questions, but know that we may not be able to answer all of them. Um, so I'll give you a little condensed timeline of first in context. Um, our initial response actually began in January of 2020 when the New Brunswick Emergency um, Measures Organization began monitoring the COVID-19 situation. We began our full activation on March 12th of 2020, which marks the beginning of our seven day work week. And as of right now, we are on day 478 of the response. So this has been the longest and largest event in the province's history. Following our full activation, the government then shut down on March 17th, and on May 28th, 2020, the COVID Cabinet Committee officially authorized our team to create a public-facing dashboard. The dashboard was then launched just over one month later on June 29th of 2020. And just to give a little insight, our Health Zone Feature Service has had over 329 million requests since it went live. And for a little more context, our province's population is only around 776,000 people. So this is an example of our COVID COP, which is a common operating picture. We maintain several COPs that help to brief senior officials and executives involved in any emergency response. The development of the COP is part of the reason why our team was tagged to create the public dashboard. Another reason was some of the unique training and structure that our team has. And I will now pass it over to Robert, who will explain a little more about our team and geo operations. Perfect. Thanks, Cleo. Um, so just a little bit of background before we get into the, the nitty gritty fun map stuff. Um, so Cleo used the term geo operations, um, which is a, a term that we've come to, to love and endear here um, in public safety. And really what it is when we say geo operations, it's, it's the use of GIS tools and data um, to really aid in emergency management. Um, it's the, the evolution in our shop of GIS professionals um, into frontline operators during um, provincial emergency and security events. And really the integration of GIS and spatial analysis into all of the phases um, of emergency management from preparedness to response to recovery, um, what have you. No, as I wait Sorry, for the, the slide here. Yeah, the slide isn't changing. There we go. <laughs> Excellent. So uh, a bit of a background history um, on geo operations, and you, you may hear us inadvertently use the term geo ops, which is just our shorthand um, of geo operations. Uh, we've got about 10 years of experience, or 10 plus years actually, of experience here in New Brunswick um, with the GIS folks supporting security and emergency events. Um, we've done everything from ice storms, um, floods are a bit of a regular issue here in New Brunswick. Uh, we're fortunate enough to get some hurricanes. Uh, we tend to have some civil unrest. Um, we do nuclear preparedness training. Um, and now we can add um, 
a global pandemic to our to our roster of events um, and and some of the tasks and things we do are really you know providing maps um, doing some spatial analysis uh, and really being key players in in providing situa situational awareness um, to our emergency managers um, and senior officials we have now become fully integrated um, into the, the, the province's Provincial Emergency Action Committee. So this is a committee that basically um, comes together uh, whenever there's a, a large security event or an emergency event in the province. Um, and, and there's you know, representation from, from each and every um, corner of government, um, private industry and, uh, and other um, emergency operators. Um, and we come together inside a Provincial Emergency Operations Center um, to really manage any kind of um, emergency event. Um, one of the ways we do that, um, as Cleo mentioned, we have our common operating picture. So um, this is an example of our, of our, um, our first operations dashboard um, product that we put together. Um, so a couple things to note on this one, uh, we have our map of New Brunswick. For those of you from the area, um, you know it well. Um, there's a couple dots on the map that, that represent um, our uh, regional emergency operations centers. So we have one of those for each of the 12 regions around the province. Uh, and we have our provincial emergency operations center um, here in Fredericton. Um, on the right, you can see uh, we've integrated the MBEMO logo. This is really meant for them. Um, if you're ever in the provincial emergency operations center, um, this sits on a giant um, screen in the front of the room so that all of the emergency action committee can view it at the same time. Um, it lists the, the event type and uh, there's a little ticker there where you can see um, see how long the event duration is. Um, typically events don't last um, 478 days. Um, sometimes events can wrap up in a couple of days or a couple of weeks. Um, but uh, this one's a little bit unique. Um, but uh, but the response and the tools are, are similar. And really um, what, what GeoOps is, is it's, it's a system, it's a system of systems. Um, we have some really rigorous training. Um, so every single member of my team, myself included, before um, they ever participate in an emergency event has formal training on emergency management, on incident command, um, training on how to interoperate inside of an emergency operations center. Um, and we have regular training ongoing just to make sure that we are, you know, being the best version of ourselves during these event. Um, preparedness is a big one for us. Uh, we are fully mobile. We are able to do remote work. Um, you know, we, we were, we, when the pandemic hit and we were, you know, government shut down, we were forced to work from home. It was not a big deal for us. We already had VPNs, laptops, headsets, and uh, uh, kind of away we went without, without missing a beat. Um, SOPs, you know, we have, we have a lot of work that repeats. Um, especially, you know, if we're making maps uh, for senior officials or for um, provincial situation reports. Um, so we've standardized those, those, those workflows. Uh, we have formal handoffs whenever, you know, we're on a seven day a week operation, 478 days strong. Um, we have a roster of team, of team, GeoOps team members. So we have formal handoffs to each one. Um, you know, our scheduling is, is, is sound. Um, and of course, after every event, we have our after action reports just to make sure um, that whatever we're doing, we're doing really well. Um, or if there are areas for improvement that we can improve them. Um, and collaboration. There is no way we could do this without um, co collaboration with our, our, our emergency management friends and, and family. Um, to give you a taste, for collaboration just for COVID-19, um, our GeoOps folks uh, almost daily liaise with, with most of these people. So whether it's the Provincial Emergency Action Committee, um, MB Power, our folks at Ambulance New Brunswick, um, you know, if there's a, if part of our province changes recovery phase colors, you know, these, these organizations need to know that so that, you know, they need to know whether or not their people can go to work. Um, we liaise with at least half of government, whether it's, and we've got several departments listed there. So Executive Council Office, Education, Service New Brunswick, Environment Local Government, Department of Health, huge partners, Public Health, huge partners, um, our Regional Health Authorities, uh, Finance and Treasury Board, our Corporate Communications folks, is just, the list is endless. 
um, and even other branches with, within our own departments. So we are within the Department of Justice and Public Safety. Um, but we support, you know, our, our friends at NBEMO, our provincial security team, our COVID operations folks, our um, inspection and enforcement teams. So those are the, um, for those that are aware, New Brunswick has um, traffic control points at every one of its borders, including the airports. Uh, and we have folks working them 24 hours a day. So uh, we support them. They feed data back into us. Um, and it's just, it's just two-way flow. Uh, we love getting external data. So uh, any external data that we can, that we can feed into our, our operating pictures for our emergency managers, we can. Um, so the example on the screen here is, is MB Power's um, outage data. So this is really key for a lot of events that we do. Um, especially things like hurricanes or, or ice storms and where um, the crux of the matter is that there's a lot of prolonged power outages. Um, so have, being able to integrate that data um, is, is crucial during flooding. Um, there are several municipalities in the province who will publish their road closure data. Um, we're able to scrape that. Um, the federal government is able to produce um, some flood layers um, during uh, our spring freshets. We're able to consume that um, and uh, really make sure everything, our emergency managers are seeing the full picture. Critical infrastructure is another huge one. Um, sometimes we know an area that's going to be affected, um, or we can predict and and, and and you know say we think this region of the province is, is likely to be the, the most affected during an emergency event, um, and then we can consult our critical infrastructure layer, you know, and see what's in the area, whether it's um, facilities of government operations, um, telecommunications assets, um, or what have you. We've 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 taken a lot of time to. To, to map as many of these features as we can across the province. Um, there's a lot, they're everywhere, um, and uh, they, become, they become really important when they stop working. Um, so it's really keen for emergency folks to be able to see these. And with the background out of the way, I'm gonna pass it back to Cleo so we can talk about the, the fun nitty gritty map stuff. Great. Thanks, Robert. Um, so here we have a couple images of the public dashboard. Um, we went through many iterations and color schemes while we were collaborating with our COVID communications team. Uh, one element that we are particularly proud of here in New Brunswick is that both our desktop and mobile versions of the dashboard are available in French and English. Um, and to accomplish this, we decided to build multiple dashboards in ArcGIS Online and wrap them in Experience Builder, which can automatically adjust the dashboard depending on the device being used to view it. And uh, there's the link at the bottom, and please feel free to go to that website and check out what, we, what information we've got available. And as always, um, we are expecting to make some significant changes in the coming weeks as our vaccination campaign continues to progress. So here's a little glimpse of our project file. Uh, one of our major difficulties that we encountered while developing the dashboard was coordinating our updates with communications. So after a few discussions with some teams at Esri, uh, we confirmed that our process of overwriting the layers and tables would be best. And while we had really great intentions of automating this whole process, it wasn't as easy or even really possible to completely standardize the many reports we receive every morning, um, of which we use to update all 14 services we currently have. Um, so this is a seven day a week job and one of our team members gathers the information and coordinates with communications every single day to push the update at the appropriate time. And that even happened on Christmas day this past year. So also to prevent errors and to keep our team accountable, a spreadsheet was created for data entry. Um, to keep it as simple as possible, we enter all the data in the order it's listed in each report that we receive, and each report has its own tab. On a separate tab, all of our data and calculations are automatically populated to match our attribute tables. Um, as well as several reports are created, and these reports uh, we send out to executives every single day. One of the biggest advantages we've had with this spreadsheet is that we are easily able to adapt to new requirements, assist the epidemiology team, and, sorry, my dog is here, um, with data requests, and as well respond to media requests with confidence, um, including one we had this morning. It's an extremely valuable tool and has been our saving grace on more than one occasion. 
So another huge undertaking came into play with the recovery phases. As of now, in New Brunswick, a region can move between yellow, orange, red, and lockdown. But you can see here our community boundaries don't align with the other larger health zone boundaries. Uh, so collaborating with the epidemiology team and with the advice of several other departments and municipal officials, uh, we were able to assign each community to a health zone. And each time there's a new mandatory order issued, uh, we provide the list of communities affected by any change in recovery phase. And in the upper right corner here of the slide, you can see the zone boundaries that have perhaps had the most amount of nudging over the pandemic. <laughs> so the next few, sl few slides are some examples of products we deliver to the executive teams every week. Uh, this first example shows weekly total of border entries at our interprovincial borders. Um, and this also includes airports. The entries are categorized as commercial or personal travel, and we also create similar figures to represent entries along our international border. Uh, this map here displays some of the regular travel that occurs between New Brunswick and Nova Scotia. Here we have used the forward sortation area, FSA, the first three characters of a postal code, to represent the place of origin and destination. The inset map at the top shows the most frequent FSA combinations, in this instance, the travel patterns are as expected by the epidemiology team. And this last map is a figure that helps to paint a picture of movement within health zones. So the percentages represent change in individuals' movement from one week to the next by aggregating cell phone data. Here you can see that, that there was reduced movement in health zone seven, while all other health zones had increased movement. And now I'll pass it back to Robert. Perfect. So just to, to close things up uh, and, and summarize a little bit, um, you know, we hope today to give you just a little taste of, you know, how how my team and I, you know, we're leveraging um, data from a whole lot of different places and using spatial analysis to really help um, geo-visualize, you know, pandemic-related information that, that you know, can, can sometimes be really complex and hard to manage. Um, we do our best to keep both the public and the executives, um, those executive decision makers, um, up to date. Um, this has really been a 478-day uh, proof of concept that uh, our geo operations team is, is sound and, and can support the mission and get the job done. Um, and really, not to be prophetic, but uh, you know, we've kind of shown that you know, GIS. You know, we're not just the people sitting in the corner. That that everything is a map. Um, every piece of data pretty much that has come in for the pandemic can be tied back to the map um, and that's kind of how we built our, our, our dashboard. Um, and I believe the next slide is just a thank you and perfect. So if you ever need to get a hold of us, we're, we're there, we're, we're, we're here seven days a week um, until uh, the end of the emergency and uh, um, ho hopefully you guys enjoyed the little sneak peek that we gave today. Thank you, Cleo and Robert. Um, we've got about two minutes for questions. I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that people should uh, put questions into the public session chat at the right side of their screen. So if you're maximized, you won't, you won't be, the picture, you won't be able to see that. So uh, if you can put the, uh, any questions you have to Cleo and Robert into the chat. So, um, so there's one I can see from, yeah. from Roger Wheat. Um, do other maritime provinces have similar mapping units? Um, I'm not sure. Um, I know GeoOps has been a little bit of my baby um, for the past 10 years, um, but it's definitely not something that I wish to ever own exclusively. Um, I know there are people in other provinces making these kinds of dashboards. I don't know if it's the the geo enthused of those provinces who have had the opportunity to make them or not. Um, but, uh, but somebody's making them, but uh, whether or not geo ops exists in those provinces, I, I, I'm not entirely convinced that they do. I like the word geo enthused. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's um, better than map nerd. It's, it's, <laughs> uh, I had a question. You referred to uh, putting your RGS online, uh, uh, maps into something called Experience Builder. Can you explain what you're talking about there? Um, yeah, so it's one of the apps actually available within ArcGIS Online. Um, and 
from we started using it, it was, I guess, relatively new still. Uh, so you can actually build a website and build um, a dashboard in Experience Builder itself. Um, but as you can see, uh, I don't think government's always known for quick, uh, quick timelines. And uh, we had about a month to throw this together. So we went with our tried and true dashboards um, and then used Experience Builder at the end. Right. One last question. Uh, Shane says, have you found COVID data resolution in rural areas has been frustrating and misleading? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. it, can, it, it can be. Essentially, um, we work with public health and with the Department of Health, and um, we have to protect people's confidentiality. So as much as we also would love to put out as much information as possible, we have had to stick to our health zones um, because that's that's what's reasonable for everybody. All right, we're going to have to uh, hold it there. Please stick around if you can for the later discussion. Thanks, Robert and Cleo. Thank you.